Well, welcome once again. Uh, this is the uh, Life School class, Forerunner School class, um, Becoming an Eternal Purpose House of Prayer or Building an Eternal Purpose House of Prayer. And this is session four, uh, which we've entitled Resisting the Great Harlot, Resisting the Great Harlot. Uh, hopefully you've listened or watched the video or read the notes from session three, where I began to uh, talk about four prayer themes that will comprise our perspective on an eternal purpose house of prayer. And we dealt with uh, the first one in the last session, in session three, on praying for the arising of the corporate man, the, man, the mature sons for the father, and a bride made ready for the son, and the need for prayer uh, into those uh, issues. And so I also talked in that session that there were three other uh, themes, major themes, that we include in our perspective of an eternal purpose house of prayer, and that's resisting the great harlot, which we'll talk about in this session, Restra restraining the spirit of Antichrist, which we will talk about in the next session, uh, and praying for Israel, which we'll talk about uh, in session six. So I'm not going to go through the all of the reasons why we've included those. I did a fairly lengthy explanation that in that in session three at the beginning of that session. So if you're interested in wanting to know more of the why we include all these in there, I think it'll become evident as we get into the teaching. But if you want that, then you can get that out of going back into session three. So I want to dig, jump right into digging into uh, the issue of the resisting the great harlot uh, because this is a major issue uh, in an eternal purpose house of prayer, I believe. And uh, just to give a little bit of testimony, I might share more about this in, in a little bit later in the session. But over the years, uh, we were introduced to this issue to pray into the spirit behind the great harlot, which we'll get into in a minute. Um, by our mentor, Noel Mann, back in as early as 1996. So it's been a number of years. And over the years, we have, even before we knew anything about eternal purpose and a, becoming an eternal purpose house of prayer, we prayed into resisting the great harlot, or at least the spirit behind the great harlot, uh, many, many times, probably more than uh, almost any other element of spiritual warfare, not probably, definitely more than any other element of spiritual warfare. And so we've, and we've seen major uh, positive things happen. We've used this, uh, these prayer tools in deliverance, and we've seen um, massive deliverances take place because of that. Uh, it's been interesting when we have... Um, when we sometimes we get to a, a block where it just seems like deliverance is not happening, we deal with this uh, spirit behind this great harlot, uh, and it opens up um, uh, a, a deliverance. And so we've seen it there. We've seen it in prayer assignments uh, that God has sent us on over the years. We've seen it in our local church. We've seen it in our worship services and our prayer time. So I'm a huge fan of the need for this. I, I want to say that at the beginning because. I want to make sure uh, I get your attention that this is important, and this will probably take some discussion and reading the notes, listening to teachings on it. I do want to say one thing about this. Um, there's another, uh, there's an extensive write-up, probably more so than in here, even in this session, in our uh, life school class, Preparing a Bride Through Deliverance, Preparing a Bride Through Deliverance, which you can find on our website, Radical Pursuit. And there's uh, two or three sessions of that that give uh, insight into the, the, the spirit behind the great harlot and the, the, the bride versus the counterfeit uh, bride. So I'm a big fan uh, of the need, not of the spirit. I mean, I, I don't like the spirit at all, but I'm a big fan of the need to stand and resist uh, the spirit behind the great harlot. So let's pray and then we'll get into talking about that. Father, we do thank you once again for the hunger and the thirst of the people that will be watching, reading, and listening to this session. And we ask, Father, that you would 
take me out of the way and communicate with clarity about this. I know that this spirit doesn't like to be uncovered, and so it's sometimes difficult to get clarity as you speak about it. But Lord, I know that you're greater than that, and so we ask that you would raise me up above it to be able to speak with clarity, to bring uh, explanation and understanding so that we can uh, with uh, that we can you that we can go to battle against this in a way that would help the bride to be made ready. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, all right, let's talk. Let's start out by talking about the true bride of Christ versus the counterfeit bride of Christ. Um, because you know that the ultimate objective of the church age is to prepare a bride for Christ, a, a sons for the Father, but a bride, a worthy bride for Christ. And so if you begin to look at the, the true bride of Christ, it's interesting that Revelation 7, chapter 17 through 22 talk about the true bride of Christ, and it also talks about uh, the harlot, which is a, a counterfeit uh, bride. But let, well, let's start out by talking about the true bride of Christ. In Revelation 21 and 22, you see in Revelation 19 that the bride has made herself ready, and immediately after that, the Lord returns. But then in chapters 21 and 22, we get a description of the new Jerusalem and of the age to come, the millennial age, but really more the the eternal ages to come. And we see the new Jerusalem that has come down to, to earth. And it's interesting about this new Jerusalem. It's said that uh, in verse 21, chapter 21, verse 2, it says, And I, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from, from God, listen to this, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And so what we see is this new Jerusalem somehow... Uh, we see that it is a city, a Jer New Jerusalem. It's a religious movement, but it's also it's the bride. It's the bride made ready. Uh, somehow, it's a building and it's a people uh, of a bride made ready. How that works, uh, we'll have to find out. But it is the bride, the the, the true bride of Christ comes down, and here in some. Here's some of the things that are said about it in those chapters. And you can read it and you can get more out of this. An eternal city on the earth. It will be a, the, uh, the father and the son will be the temple inside of it. Their throne will be there. Third, the city will be holy. For as we learn, nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it. So it'll be holy, it'll be a holy. Now one interesting point, when we'll get to the, the counterfeit, the harlot, it will, we'll find out that she is full of abominations. Even while the, the, the true bride, there no one who practices abomination will be in this one. Fourth, he who overcomes shall inherit these things. Again, the bride made ready, the, the overcoming son will inherit these things. The, the holy city, the New Jerusalem is both a holy city and a bride for Christ. Uh, so anyway, we could talk about more of that in other sessions. And then, like I said, that other, the, the preparing a bride through deliverance class has more about this. But in contrast to God's eternal plan, uh, Satan is raising up a counterfeit to seduce and oppose people from realizing God's eternal purpose. You see, what you see is that you see the bride, the, the objective, the goal of the bride made ready, the eternal city, but you also see the, uh, the, the great harlot, the, the uh, harlot Babylon, which is a counterfeit bride. It also is a city. It also is a woman, uh, not a, really a bride, but a prostitute uh, who tries to seduce the church um, and the people of God uh, away from being a part of this true uh, bridal company described by the New Jerusalem 
And it also tries to kill them. So we see two aspects of it. We see a seduction and, a, and a, almost like a killing because she's drunk with the blood uh, of the saints. Um, so we, we see, uh, you know, a, really a complete opposite. We see a complete opposite between the bride made ready and this harlot, this counterfeit that tries to seduce uh, it. Now, let me read, this, let me read a uh, quote. This is from Joel Richardson's book, Mystery Babylon, and he writes about the great harlot. She is once a queen. She is at once, at the same time, a queen, a prostitute, and a cold-blooded killer. And so that's, this is that harlot. This is that harlot that tries to kill the saints, seduce the saints, uh, and a false queen. High in the air, she proudly weighs a gold cup. Though it gleams on the outside, it is filled with a horrific mixture of the shed blood of God's holy martyrs and the sickening impurities of her prostitution. Not only has she, has she drunk from this cup, but she has also enticed the kings of the earth and even entire nations to drink from it. The woman is full of arrogance, rebellion, and raw self-glorification. Like the proverbial, proverbial ring of gold in a swine's snout, though masquerading as a queen, she is in fact a vile, classless prostitute. She has seduced the kings of the earth to live luxuriously with her. Now, uh, what we see is that we see the pure bride over here and we see this prostitute, which is the exact opposite of that. And this prostitute is trying to seduce believers, the world, non-believers, the kings of the earth, and or murder them or oppose them, kill them, uh, in order to see her goals uh, uh, to arise and to resist the coming forth of this true bride made ready. Because who is the, who is the queen of heaven? Who is the ultimate queen that rules the earth. It's the bride. Jesus is the king and his bride is the queen. But this harlot wants to be that queen of, uh, of, of the heavens to rule the earth. And so there's this great clash of kingdoms that will culminate at the end of the age in Revel recorded in Revelation 17, 18, uh, and 19, and even 20 and 21 and 22, we see this clash of the, of the kingdoms that take place there. Uh, and so it's the, there's a war that's going on even now between this harlot and between the bride to oppose the bride from coming forth. And so what the, a house of prayer has to do is it has to not only pray for the bride to arise, to come forth, but it also has to resist uh, this movement in the earth. Now, there are a lot of different opinions as to what this harlot really is as it manifests in the natural realm uh, in the earth. There's, some have said it's uh, Rome. Some have said it's uh, just different things. The Catholic Church, others have said it's just a, a number of different entities. As, as we have said in our end time class, understanding the end times, our belief is that the great harlot of Revelation 17 is the new world order, the global new world order uh, that is being ra raised up around the earth even as we speak with all the things that are going on now. The objective is to build a, a, an environment in which Christ has no place, in which the bride cannot be ready. And this spirit, this, this issue uh, is through, they are doing this through seduction and opposition. Uh, you see it with seduction where it's seducing people into the, away from Christ into this false uh, worldly system. Uh, but you also see it, you also see violence and murder and opposition uh, and restraint taking place as well to, to keep this from coming forth. And so in, a, in an eternal purpose house of prayer, not only do we need to pray for the bride to arise, the true bride to arise, the, the, the mature son to arise, which we talked about in the last session, 
We also need uh, to pray into resisting this great harlot in all of its uh, tentacles that is trying to resist the true bride from coming forth. Remember in the last session, and we haven't read it in this session, but in Revelation chapter 12, we see the woman about to give birth to the man-child and the dragon is standing right there before her trying to devour her, the man-child, and to oppose the giving of birth. This is the, uh, the, both the harlot and the spirit of Antichrist coming together, the woman riding the beast, as Revelation 17 says, to come together to oppose this coming forth of, of the true bride of Christ. And so there's a warring dimension that needs to take place in uh, an eternal purpose house of prayer that resists uh, these things uh, that are trying to take place in, in the earth. So this is at the natural level. We see a globalist movement taking place and, you know, as we're speaking this, uh, I think we're all amazed at how rapidly things are happening. Uh, you just look at different parts of the world. I mean, right now I'm speaking this in 2021, the fall of 2021, and uh, just watching videos of what's going on in Australia are just unbelievable. You, when you see these things happening, just the, the, the police just resisting people and uh, because they're going out of their house w without a mask on or whatever the issues are. It's, it's amazing what's happening. Uh, we happened to talk to uh, Noel's wife, Di, this uh, past week, um, earlier in the week, um, and she was saying, I'm living in a communist nation now. And, and you know, Australia was so free and uh, I don't know. It's just it's amazing. But it's not only there. It's happening many other places in Europe and Canada and, and, and even certain places in America. It's crazy what's going on. But there's this conflict uh, uh, of trying to oppose freedom, but there's more to it than freedom at stake. It's the freedom of religion, the freedom of expression, of to be a bride made ready with free expression. And there's, there's more, a lot more to that than that we have time to talk about now. But that's going on in the natural. The, the globalists are trying to build this uh, global uh, network or what, however it materializes where true Christianity is pushed out of the way. Uh, and so there's a battle there. So as we pray for the corporate man to arise, we also have to pray into this war that's going on uh, in the earth. Now... What I want us to deal with, though, is more, I mean, there's, there's certainly issues that relate to the natural that we can pray into. Just to give you one example, uh, in, this, in America, in this 2020 presidential election, um, I, I'm not getting, trying to get political here, but we believed that the Lord said that uh, President Trump was to be reelected, and was re in fact was reelected, um, but where the uh, globalists and, and others wanted uh, President Biden to be elected. So we warred, we had, I don't know how many prayer meetings, but we, we prayed three and four nights a week for the fraud and the, to be determined uh, to be exposed and all the things and for God's will to be done. Uh, and so we did that for during the month of November, December, and even into January. Um, and so we, we dealt with prayer pretty much at the natural level, at the natural level of what we felt like this globalist agenda was trying to implement a, a fraudulent election to take away one who would stand for America as opposed to this globalist network. And so I believe that was led of the Lord. I, I, the Lord spoke to me and he said uh, that you did more through this prayer assignment, even though it didn't work out the way we thought it would, 
he said, you did more in this prayer assignment to fill the, all, the bowls of incense than you ever have in all, throughout the history of your church. Uh, and so uh, I'll take that as the Lord saying that. I believe that is true, that he said that. So there are issues that we pray in, as we pray into these things into the natural level. But I want to deal right now with the, the spirit uh, behind uh, the, the natural level. We, we get a key to that. This is how we find out that, I think, is uh, in Revelation 18, 7, in talking about the harlot, it says, She says in her heart, I sit as a queen, and I am not a widow, and will never, uh, and, and will never see mourning. She sits as a queen. And so that verse of Scripture is a quote from Isaiah chapter 47. That's a direct quote from Isaiah chapter 47. So that gives us a key to the spirit behind this harlot that is manifesting and opposing the coming forth of the true bride of Christ. The spirit behind it is the queen of heaven. The queen of heaven uh, is a global world ruler uh, that uh, opposes uh, true Christianity and is quoted, there's a whole, all of Isaiah 47 deals with that spirit, not so much uh, a natural realm, but the spirit behind that, the virgin daughter of Babylon. A lot of people, commentaries, would say it deals with Babylon. It de didn't deal so much directly with Babylon, but as the, the virgin daughter, the spirit, the, 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 ver the fertility goddess that uh, is a part of the of worship that went on in Babylon. And, it's, and there's places in the scripture where it uh, appears. Jeremiah, twi twice in Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah 7, 16 through 18, and Jeremiah 44, 15 uh, through 19. And the, the, the Lord told, the Lord comes against the people for worshiping at the queen, the queen of heaven. And in Jeremiah 7, 16, it says, as for you, do not pray, talking to Jeremiah, do not pray for these people and do not lift up a cry or prayer for them and do not intercede with me for I do not hear you. Uh, do you not see what they are doing in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood and the fathers kindle the fire and the women knead the dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. Uh, and they pour out drink offerings to other gods in order uh, to spite me. So we see that there's a, there's a, a reference to the queen of heaven, and it's the spirit behind the, the great harlot. Now, it's all over the world. How did it become a world ruler? Well, it goes back at least to the Tower of Babel. Uh, at the Tower of Babel, the Tower of Babel was not just a, uh, uh, you know, just a tower that tried to get up to heaven. It was a ziggurat, ziggurat, I've forgotten exactly how to pronounce it, which had the, there was a, a lot of things that went on there. But one of the things that was there was there was a place of worship for Ishtar, uh, which was one of the manifestations of the queen, uh, a fertility goddess. There was one of the manifestations of the queen of heaven. And so when the Tower of Babel uh, was scattered, uh, you know, at the time of the Tower of Babel, when that was scattered, all of the uh, issues and practices of the people, uh, worship of the fertility goddess was spread all over the known world at that time. And so you see as you begin to, um, as you begin to see the, uh, the, the worship of the people in different parts of the Middle East in ancient times, you see the various tentacles of this queen of heaven be in worship where even though the names of the goddesses are, are different, their practices are very similar and they're very, they're very similar to what this great harlot of Revelation 17 and 18 is trying to do uh, today to oppose and seduce people away from the, being the true bride. And so as an eternal purpose house of prayer, uh, we, as we resist this great harlot, a lot of what we're doing is we're resisting the spirit behind the great, har the, the great harlot. There are natural things, like I talked about in the election, but there's also a dealing with the spirit uh, behind uh, the great harlot, uh, which is the queen uh, of heaven. Now, let's look 
let's look at some of the manifestations of the Queen of Heaven that took place through ancient goddess worship because this, these become some of the issues that we have to deal with <coughs> as part of an eternal purpose house of prayer. Uh, I've listed them in your notes. They're on page, start on page five. Uh, point three says, the manifestations of the Queen of Heaven through ancient goddess worship included virtually the same practice, practices everywhere it appeared. Uh, and so here are some of the things that took place. Because you see this is happening now. And the spirit behind the harlot is seducing individual believers as well as nations uh, into these things, same things so that the queen of heaven is worshipped and the harlot comes forth to oppose the true bride from coming forth. Uh, so here's some of them. Hetero and homosexual immorality and perversion. That was practiced uh, in, this, in the worship cults of the fertility goddesses. They, think, they thought that, that if a, uh, if se they thought that sex would produce good crops, so they would have a priest or a priestess uh, involved in, in heterosexual uh, intercourse so that uh, that would be a sign to the fertility goddess to produce crops. But there was not just uh, heterosexual immorality, there was homosexual uh, in immorality uh, as well. And there's more in, in your notes, and I'm not going to try to spend a lot of time on this, but it, you see that the things that are going on in the world today, this global system, you see all the things with transgender issues and the woke issues with our, in America with the military and all the different issues are are really just tentacles of this manifestation of the hetero and homosexual uh, uh, patterns that uh, took place even going back to ancient days. There was drunkenness and drug use that took place uh, at the, in the worship of these goddesses throughout the earth, and I won't go into that. There was witchcraft that took place um, of course, in Isaiah 47, we see that in, in, in spite of the great power of your spells, evil will come upon you that you would not know how to charm away. So there was a lot of witchcraft that was practiced there. There was control. The fertility goddesses almost universally were goddesses of love, war, and sex, and they used those things uh, to control people. Uh, there was emasculation of men that took place in some of the places men would actually, in the frenzy of the worship, would actually castrate themselves uh, in order to worship the, the, the fertility goddess. Uh, other places, they wouldn't necessarily do that, but they would dress up in effeminate uh, attire to be able to worship and to closely identify with this. Prophetic oracles that would take place. Um, one of the places that we saw in Atlanta where we, where we live, there was a place called Conyers, which is close to this, a suburb uh, just not far out of Atlanta. And from 1990 to 98, there was this apparitions of Mary, which would not really, uh, really marry the mother of, of Jesus, but Mary, the, uh, the, it was actually the queen of heaven that came across as Mary, giving these prophetic oracles uh, of that. And so, uh, you know, we did, we actually did a prayer assignment, a brief prayer assignment uh, there uh, on the, the site there uh, to declaring Isaiah 47 uh, for her, that spirit uh, to come down. So we, we see a lot of those manifestations that were there in ancient times all over the, the known world and those same things are, being ha are happening here. Uh, and so the Queen of Heaven, I would say one of the main, if you had to label it, uh, although this is not totally true, would be it affects the culture. Whereas the spirit of Antichrist, which we'll get to in the next session, affects, impacts governmental laws and uh, media and different things like that, the queen of heaven uh, tries to pervert the culture, pervert the culture, and both end up seducing 
in opposing and even murdering uh, the saints uh, of, of God. Uh, so, but they definitely try to kill the, the bridal uh, connection. But with the, church, the eternal purpose house of prayer is not just to ignore all this. This is what I want to make, the point I want to make. Because there, there, there are a number of people who, who focus on praying into these things. And the stuff we talked about in the last session, they would say, great, yeah, let's do that. Let's pray for the rise of the corporate man. But I don't want to get into praying into issues like the queen of heaven would manifest. I don't want to get into issues like that. I don't want to pray into those kind of things. I don't want to pray into the change of law. It's too political or it's too, uh, it's too um, just divide, divisive where it divides people. We don't want to pray into all those things. So, but the, the, our, our view is that eternal purpose house of prayer has to not only pray for the corporate man to arise, but also to resist the harlot, but also in doing so, primarily resist the spirit behind the harlot, which is the queen uh, of heaven. Now, uh, I want to begin to talk about that call to resist. Uh, the scriptures teach that God will pronounce judgment on the queen of heaven as the church resists her work. Now, let's, let me read this scripture verse. Revelation chapter 18 Verse 20, and this is talking about the queen of heaven. And it says, rejoice over her, talking about mystery Babylon, the great harlot. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, because God has pronounced judgment for you against her. Now, that, that sounds like God's going to do it. And, but then if you read it in the American standard, which uh, if you look at the Greek, this is probably a more accurate uh, in translation of the literal Greek. The American standard captures it that saying this, rejoice over her, thou heaven and ye saints and apostles and prophets. And here's what I want you to hear. For God has judged your judgment on her. God has judged your judgment on her. And so there's, there's a partnership. It's not just a sovereign thing that God will do. There's a partnership of, of prayer and spiritual warfare that has to go into this uh, to participate in partnership with, with the Lord to bring judgment on this great harlot and the spirit behind it so that it doesn't oppose or doesn't be successful in its opposition to the bride being made ready. Uh, now, there's a number of, you know, there's specific things as the Lord brings to our attention. And there's a, we deal with spiritual warfare later in, the, in this class because we want to make sure we, we deal in a safe way there. And there are some things that we will we'll talk about later. But for now, just uh, what I want you to know is that we are called to resist uh, not only the harlot, but the spirit and the, the different demonic spirits behind uh, the harlot. Uh, another point, the scriptures tell the church not to tolerate the woman Jezebel. You know, to the message to the church at Thyatira, I have this against you that you tolerate the woman Jezebel. We can't tolerate the woman Jezebel in both our uh, lives, our churches, and, uh, you know, those areas where God has given assignment. Now, how is the queen of heaven connected to the spirit of Jezebel? Well, here's the, the, the real brief uh, summary there. The spirit of Jezebel is that spirit that, uh, that, uh, that demonizes individuals, that affects individuals and churches and things like that. Jezebel, the, the biblical character Jezebel, worshipped the queen of heaven. She was a priestess of, uh, of the Asherah, which was one of the manifestations of the queen of heaven. And therefore, she became uh, a, a worshiper and her traits that, that, that filled her that came from the queen of heaven characterized her as Jezebel. So when Jesus spoke about not to Thyatira, don't I have this against you, you tolerate the woman Jezebel, what he was saying to uh, Thyatira is that these same traits that were on the character Jezebel, which are the same ones that affected the, the, the ruler of the queen of heaven, the fertility goddesses, 
there. Don't tolerate those issues. In other, stand, in other words, stand against those things. Uh, again, another support for praying uh, in uh, to that. And there's, there's two, two phrases that I think would characterize, characterize the way we need to pray. Come out of her and calling her to come down. Uh, and let's talk about those. If you read Revelation 18, 4 and 5, here's what it says. Again, talking about the great harlot and the spirit behind it. Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive of her plagues. For her sins have piled as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. So he says, come out of her. Now, he's talking about the great harlot and all the different stuff that's be, being done, even in today's culture. Come out of all that. But he's also talking about the different tentacles of this queen of heaven. Come out of her. Come out of entanglement with her. Don't participate in all of the stuff that she's doing. Don't participate in her sins. Come out of her. And of course, this creates a a massive prayer assignment for the, for the church to call individuals, whether they're believers or non-believers, whether they're churches or cities or whatever, come out of entanglement. America, come out. Come out of entanglement with the queen of heaven. Come out of entanglement with the spirit of Jezebel. We don't want you to participate in her sins and receive of her plagues. Come out. And of course you can see that as the spirit leads, we can pray along that particular uh, uh, line of prayer to, for calling people out of her. But the Spirit, the Scriptures also say for, her, for the church to call her to come down uh, out of that. So as you look at Isaiah 47, this is where you would find this, verse 1, Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground without a throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for you shall no longer be, uh, for you shall no longer be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones, grind the mill, remove the veil, strip off the skirt, cross the rivers. Your nakedness will be uncovered. Your shame will be exposed. I will take vengeance and will not spare a man. Our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, is his name, the Holy One of Israel. Sit silently and go into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans. Listen to this. For you will no longer be called the Queen of Kingdoms. Uh, and so the whole chapter really deals with this. But it's saying to her, to that spirit, come down from your throne. Come down and sit in the dust. Uh, you know, and you, you see a lot of, sits, verse 5 says, sit silently and go into darkness. Other places it says, none, it, there's none to save you. And in, in spite of your spells, uh, you know, you, you read this and what you, what you see, you see a call for that spirit to come down in its rulership over, in this case, Babylon, but over uh, the, the cities, the nations, the churches, the individuals, to come down from its place of enthronement, where it's enthroned, come down. And, it, you know, if you look at the chapter, it deals with witchcraft. It deals with sexual sin. Uh, it deals with false religions. It deals with uh, uh, all sorts of spells and, and things along those lines. It deals with all of those things. And it says, come down. So the, the, if you had to pick, if you had to say, how do we pray against the great harlot and the spirit behind that? There are two major th themes. Come out of her, my people, and come down from your enthronement over her. And so, you know, in our own prayer assignments, we have, we have prayed both of those. We've prayed for, for people and people groups to come out, of, uh, come out of her, churches to come out of, movements to come out uh, of, of her snare, false church movements come out the prosperity gospel and other different kind of movements come out of her, my people. We pray to even for the Catholic Church and all the snares, all the false religions of the Catholic Church. You know, uh, I mean, uh, um, there's a couple of illustrations on 
some of these things. And when we were, when Donna and I, for our 50th uh, wedding anniversary, we went to Italy for our, our anniversary trip. And it was a wonderful, wonderful trip. And, uh, but one of the things that was a real eye opener to me was the way that Mary worship was exalted above Christ in many people and lives there. I mean, we went to, I think it was Siena. We went in, in the kind of like uh, the Tuscan uh, area. We went on a bus trip, a day bus trip, and we had this tour. And the tour guide was a, a strong Catholic lady, and she was elevating uh, Mary above, above Christ, that she was the door to salvation and things like that, and I, and I confronted her on it. I asked her, I was trying to be nice, but Donna said I wasn't that nice about it, but um, I said, Jesus, I said, Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Not Mary or the Queen of Heaven. It's, it was amazing, but there's a need for them, for people to come out of that, come out of that snare from all of that. But there's another aspect of it, come down, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Um, and we've had a number of prayer assignments. We, we, we declare Isaiah 47 more than any other passage of Scripture in the Bible. I bet we declare it once a week in some of our gatherings. Uh, uh, and and it's, it's powerful, very, very powerful. Uh, and we've used it in prayer assignments and different ways. And I, I remember one, I don't know, what came of it, but I, 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 there's not that I know of any particular result. I wish I could say that everything worked out, but I, maybe it did. I don't know what, what happened or what didn't happen. But in the 1996 Olympics, uh, it was crazy what went on. They were in Atlanta where we live, and we were watching it on TV. And in the opening ceremony, the... Um, the people leading it, and the President of the United States was actually there. Bill Clinton was the President at the time, I think. And he was there at that ceremony. And at the ceremony, the whoever was speaking invited the, ruler, the, the spirit of every nation in the earth to come into Atlanta. And we thought, oh my goodness, what are you doing? Uh, and it really made a negative impact upon the city. Before that time, the church, it was, there was really the, 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 the seeds of a revival taking place in Atlanta. Um, there was a, a ministry in downtown Atlanta called Blood and Fire. And the church, many in the church would gather down there for corporate meetings. And so it was an old warehouse. I mean, it just leaked when it rained. And, and, but uh, it was powerful, powerful. Uh, where the glory of the Lord was beginning to fall. It was a great, God was using that to unite the church and the city and a lot of things were happening good. But right after that, it was amazing. All of that fell apart. And that whole ministry left, fell apart and is gone now. Um, and you could see that spirit, those spirits there. But we... We felt to do a, a, an assignment. One of the things that happened also at that opening ceremony of the Olympics is they erected a temple to Zeus uh, there in the, in the middle of the Olympic Stadium. And so we took a, a team down there and did a prayer assignment. And one of the things that we did was declare to Isaiah 47, come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon, uh, the dust without uh, a throne. And so you, I'm, I'm using that. I'm not sure... What happened? But I'm using that as an example of how you can declare the written judgments of the Lord to pray for those things uh, to come down. So, two major aspects: come out and come down. Now, let me. And this will be the last part of the session, but let me just talk about several uh, several of the traits. Uh, there and you know things you can pray against in terms of come out or come down. Uh, first, uh, hindrance and opposition to the, fulfill, uh, the fulfillment of God's purposes. So much of that is uh, uh, this spirit tries to do. Attacks on godly leaders. Now this uh, de declaration of Isaiah 47, when you get under oppression, depression, uh, just 
you know, closed heavens, warfare, many other things. We, do, we declare Isaiah 47 a lot, just my, my wife and I. We declare it over our church. We declare it over our own uh, life, uh, these, uh, these attacks on godly leaders. But it's also uh, issues like sexual sin, sexual perversion, homosexuality, abortion, drunkenness and drug use, witchcraft, control and manipulation, strife, contention, division, and disunity, um, fear, oppression, intimidation, and de depression, uh, emasculation of men, false religions, and these are all in your notes, cults, compromised Christianity, and false prophetic oracles. You know, all of those things are tentacles of this queen of heaven, and many of these are affecting the church, are affecting leadership in the church, are affecting uh, our cities and our nations, are affecting the culture. Again, a lot of times the queen of heaven affects the culture, uh, whereas the spirit of Antichrist ref, uh, impacts uh, laws and uh, policies, governmental policies and media and different things like that. But the, the point for now, and I'll close with this, is we do need primarily, our primary task is to call, pray into the rising of the corporate man. Uh, the man, the man child of Revelation 12, the bride made ready of Revelation 19. But there are, there in, as in doing that, there are times when we need to resist the spirit and the, the great harlot and the spirit behind that uh, using two primary themes. Come out of her, my people, and come down from your enthronement upon the earth. Again, we need to We'll, we'll deal with more with uh, principles related to spiritual warfare in a later session. Uh, but we need to incorporate this element of spiritual warfare uh, in our eternal purpose house of prayer. Both are needed uh, in order to see the bride made ready in the eternal city, the pure spotless bride uh, come forth. So let's do it. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen.